Thank you guys for participating and you can be seated and how incredible to consider the living presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in us by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus in me, what an incredible, incredible message of hope in these days. And I do so thank our praise team for their diligence and being a part of our continuance of being able to worship together in spirit and in truth and these incredible days that we live in. So this morning we're going to turn our attention back to this incredible exposition of the book of Ruth. And I'll see if we can, can we move forward there? Can we move that? Is um, that up or on or? Let's get reset here, everybody. Just breathe, huh? Okay, there we go. That's the Boston Marathon starting line. Um, that was a that was a dream of mine. Um, don't think it would ever happen unless I got an exemption. <laughs> you have to qualify for that, but. Uh, I thought it was such a, a cool thought because that was actually the painted starting line for this year, which never did occur because of it getting canceled. But kind of leads us into uh, today. Identification, whether it be natural or spiritual, it really is so crucially important. In a natural way, we so identify with our families, don't we? And we identify with our friends. We identify with our country, with the United States of America in so many ways. Our state, uh, our community, our uh, recreation. I wore my uh, running tie today, uh, which has 5K up to a marathon. And I identify with that. But also with our education, um, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, whose key thought is ut pro sem, which means that I may serve. Uh, I identify with them and even with the mask in 2020 that my sister had made uh, for me. But much more important than those physical identifications that we make is our spiritual identification. Even as we gather together, we're identifying with uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as new creations in Him by grace through faith. We're identifying with the Word of God and with the whole thought of worship in spirit and truth. And such an important thing is we identify not only as a part of the church, that Jesus Christ is building and the gates of Hades would never prevail against it. But we identify with this local church called Fellowship Chapel and what God is doing and willing specifically in us and through us and how thankful I am to be a part of us. So identification, we've talked about it a lot recently in a lot of our studies. And today we're going to revisit it. It's really the dominating topic of Ruth, uh, chapter 1, verses 16 to uh, 22. So it's with that introduction, I want to invite you guys, if you would turn with me in the Old Testament, uh, Hebrew scriptures, uh, to the book of Ruth. And we are going to continue our considerations of a proclamation that we're entitling Ruth, the setting. And this will finish us up on Ruth uh, chapter 1. And as we do come again, we do ask God's richest blessing. Uh, we just saying, I'm desperate for you. And God never designed us to live independent or, ap or apart from Him. We were made for Him and to live in dependence upon Him, for us to draw our life and physical, spiritual, everything from Him. So as we come today, we're just dependent upon the Holy Spirit to illumine His revelation 
authoritative and final. And for, for us, as we interpret it, as we do literally and grammatically, historically, for it really to end not just with us being informed, but really, really being transformed. And today, this is really a very strong, practical, profound, applicable message. And maybe as we move along through, maybe look for those spots that may really be spotlighted uh, by the Holy Spirit uh, for you. So we want to continue on in this absolutely incredible book. I was going to give us what I called uh, R squared, a Ruth reset, very quick, just to sort of let us know where we are here in uh, the book of Ruth. We've seen an overview. We've said it's historical, theological, so profound and presenting God as providential and sovereign, but also it is so practical. And you're going to see that, I pray, today as we work through here in 2020. Our blueprint, really we're in the first section, chapters 1 and 2, and What's really highlighted here so powerfully is the God's sovereign and providential preparation. And that's such a vital piece of even today. That has moved us into what we're calling the setting, which is really the first uh, chapter. And we made two pastoral uh, observations here. The first is the journey from Bethlehem, Judah to Moab. And in that, we saw the trial in Judah, testing. And then we saw the tragedy that was in Moab. And that's led us to our second pastor's observation. And we're calling that Naomi's return to Bethlehem with Ruth. And our interpretive insights here are really embodying what we've said are just two uh, textual thoughts. We saw one last week. We called it Naomi's decision to return to Bethlehem from verse 6 through 15. And just a couple of the hallmarks from last week were Naomi's choice. We really emphasize that. Naomi's appeal that she makes. Then we saw Orpah's choice. And we left off with Ruth uh, clinging. And I just wanted to give us an insight from Dr. David Jeremiah, who I referenced earlier. He says, Ruth clung to Naomi. The word suggests commitment, faithful cleaving within a deeply personal relationship. The same word is used biblically to describe how a husband should bond to his wife. And that was so prevalent and powerful for me uh, on this day in particular. But also, he says, and a person to God. So scene two ends, and we're left with the question that we had last week. Who? Spiritually? And physically, and what will Ruth choose? Who will she choose to identify with? Will it be Jehovah, the God of the Israelites, or Chemosh, the idol of the Moabites? Will it be Naomi and the Israelites, or will it be her family and the Moabites? You see, we left off with an incredible, defining moment that was going to determine the direction and the destiny in all of her living. That leads us to Ruth's choice to identify with Naomi, the Israelites, and the God of Israel. Verses 16 to 22. And you can follow along as I... I read there. But, Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. 
Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is really an incredible wow portion of Scripture. Historically accurate with so many profound applications. So as the third scene begins, as the curtain opens up, as Ruth is clinging to Naomi, Ruth says this. And remember, she has really endured three entreaties for her, for her to return back to the Moabites. But she says this, entreat, urge me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. What I want us to note here is this is an expression of deep personal love determination, as we will see, of loyalty, of faithfulness, of commitment. You know, as the heart uh, senses, the Word of God tells us the mouth speaks. And she is revealing here a heartfelt desire to be with no, Naomi no matter what. I've counted the cost, and I'm more than willing to take the risk. Verse 16 continues, and Ruth says, For wherever you go, I will go. You know, Pam said that in one sense years ago, till death do us part. I'm just really grateful she hasn't killed me so that she would then be able. But the whole thought here is, I'm with you. When Pam said yes on the 23rd of August in 1980, I was working and had a great job in the business community and was serving and, and then three years went that way but then we had a major life change, going to work with the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Really took so much of a, a cut in pay that we really did not know sometimes where our next meal was coming from, but we believed it was God's will. I've told you the story where I had just one time I wanted a turkey. and We couldn't afford to buy a turkey. I went to speak at an FCA group in... Um, the southern part of Alabama. I spoke at that group, and when we were leaving there, there was a man, he came up to me afterwards, and his son was in that group, and he said, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for coming and sharing with our group. Here, we want to give you this, and he was a turkey farmer, and he gave me a smoked turkey. I went home that day, and I put that turkey on the little table, you, Paul, you'd never believe it. I actually built that table out of wood. It wasn't really good, but it was, it, was, it was our table. I threw that turkey on there, and I just burst out crying. The incredible work of God, providentially, sovereignly. What Naomi is hearing here is, I'm going to identify myself with you. 
Naomi and Ruth will in one sense be inseparable. We're family, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. And then verse 16 continues and says, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. I just kind of saw this as wherever you choose to dwell, I'm going to dwell there with you. And then verse 16 is the climactic statement of identification. It really lays the foundation for the remainder of this book. And we'll see that as we move forward. But it, Ruth says, your people shall be my people. In essence, the Israelites from verse 16, God's covenant people are my people. Incredible confession. And then this is the exclamation point. And your God, my God, Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord, the Almighty, the God of Israel. No telling where she had heard and through the family, through all kinds of other means. But this is an incredible, incredible commitment. Ruth is expressing here a choice of looking and turning away from. In essence, disassociating, disidentifying with. Orpah went back, but not Ruth. She turns away from Chamash and idol worship and vain religion. She turns away from the Moabites and the country and nation that she grew up in, even from her family. She turns away from familiarity, from past history, old living, old habit patterns, customs, culture, beliefs, and yes, security. It's an incredible choice. But not only is it turning away from, she is willfully choosing in love to be looking and turning to. Jake, you've always mentioned that so many times, that God doesn't lead us into a vacuum. There may be a turning away, but there's a turning to. And this turning is to is an association, an identification with Jehovah. Don't miss that. The God of Israel, the true and living God, first and foremost... She's turning to the Israelites, a, a foreign country and nation. She's turning to Naomi, her extended family. She's turning to a new beginning, and that's so important to see here for us. Yes, it has uncertainty, doesn't it? New beginnings many times have uncertainty, but we, we go. Is that not what Abraham did? There was uncertainty there, but he obeyed the Lord and he responded in faith. And I see that laced in here. A new land, a new people, most importantly, a new God. Dr. David Jeremiah says that Ruth followed a God that she did not yet know. I, I believe she's committing to him here but it says, into an uncertain future among potentially hostile strangers. And she became a matriarch in the lineage of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? That choice that we make by faith to follow him as he leads us and guides us, turning away and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ, looking unto him, Incredible. That's our spiritual identification. What a great application here. And what an incredible testimony of profession and confession she makes uh, here. Many have said this is one of the most beautiful expressions of commitment in all of literature. We'll read later where it's pointed to in the scripture, but in all of literature. She's putting her future in the hands of God and committing herself to him and to Naomi and, and to the Israelite people. And then in verse 17, if that's not enough, she, she continues on with this incredible resolution that is so solid and firm. 
You know, just like that Boston Marathon start line, so many people can start, but they don't firmly, steadfastly, resolutely finish. But see, what she's saying here is she's making a commitment to finish. Not only start, she says, where you die, I will die. When it's over, it's over. And there will I be buried. And she continues this incredible vow, sealing it in the name of the Lord. The Lord do so to me and more also. It's almost like your yes being yes, your no being no, and her yes is yes, and she's sealing it here. The NIV says, may the Lord deal with me, be it so ever severely. You see, she has counted this out. If anything but death parts or separates you and me. Beloved, this is powerful. This is so applicable. This is a personal, solemn, serious, very strong vow to Naomi. But it is before the Lord. It is before the holy name of God, Jehovah. These are amazing, amazing thoughts. There are those who just see this as one of the strongest statements of commitment in all of literature and in the scriptures. I wanted to read what Warren Wiersbe says here. I know, uh, Rob, you read him along with me and appreciate him, and you probably came across this this week. Ruth's statement in Ruth 1, 16 and 17 is one of the most magnificent confessions found anywhere in Scripture. First, she confessed her love for Naomi and her desire to stay with her mother-in-law even unto death. Then she confessed her faith in the true and the living God and her decision to worship Him alone. She was willing to forsake father and mother in order to cleave to Naomi and the God of her people. Ruth was steadfastly determined to accompany Naomi and to live in Bethlehem with God's uh, promised or covenant people. The one thing we're going to see here that's so incredible is that she manifests throughout the rest of this book, this confession. She lives it out. And that is so, so powerful and is so affirmed as we move through the book. I thought about her and I thought about this T-shirt that someone in our church gave me, the Baltimore Raven shirt. It says, you can see it, it says, all in. And as I was researching this, that's what I thought about her and our vernacular. Ruth was, was all in. She was surrendered. She was yielded. She was dedicated. She was committed. Or as Oswald Chambers would say, she was abandoned to God. I thought about Isaiah. In Isaiah 6, and you know that probably very well. And what does Isaiah say when he hears the questioning of God of who will we send? You know what he says? Here I am. Send me. See, that's the heart, I think, of Ruth. I'm surrendered. I'm yielded. I'm all in. Oh, it may be uncertain, it may be insecure. The world can provide some of those, but no, I'm all in. In 1983, I, I sat in a church service where I heard a guy named Stedman Sheely, and I had played football against him at Virginia Tech, and he played for the University of Alabama and won two national championships, and he was speaking at a church. Pam and I went to hear him speak, and as he spoke, I was just sitting there in that pew that morning, and I remember it like it was yesterday. 
I just said, Lord, take my life. Do what you will with it. It was a powerful step inspired by the Holy Spirit. As a new creation in Christ, have you taken that step of really conscious surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, to who He is, all He has, what He desires? My life has never been the same since February 6, 1983. I don't think Ruth's life was ever the same. Verse 18 takes us to the next step in this scene. When she, Naomi, saw, I like the translation that says realized, that she, Ruth, was determined to go with her. And the word determined here means a firm decision. It's manifesting resolve. She'd made her mind up. She'd set her will. As Jesus would say, you know, when you put your hands to the plow, don't look back. And she had done that. And verse 18 says that Naomi stopped speaking to her. And I just want us to note here, this isn't negatively as it may read, but positively. Naomi respectfully embraces Ruth's decision, her choice, and she no longer appeals or urges her to turn back. I think it just shows an amazing reflection of the heart and respect that Naomi had for her. That leads us to uh, verse 19. Now the two of them went until they had come to Bethlehem. As I thought about this, I wonder if they went to visit the graves one last time, knowing they probably weren't going to be coming back this way again. I know I would have. My husband, my sons. Maybe they just kind of got that last bit together and closed all those loopholes and crossed all those T's. And then they start. And it's a 50-mile journey. I'll go back real quick. A 50-mile journey here around the Dead Sea. If you're walking at three miles per hour, that's 16 hours. I don't know that they would have been going that, that fast. A lot of people think it took them about a week or, or 10 days to get there. It was a, a very difficult trek. Just a couple of facts. The elevation changes themselves were incredible. They descended from Moab about 4,500 feet. Then they ascended 3,500 feet through the Judean hills. I don't know how close they might have come to the Dead Sea, but it's 1,400 feet below sea level. It was a very dangerous trek. There was animals, there was thieves. I wonder what they talked about in that time. I wonder if Naomi was briefing Ruth on Bethlehem, the people, the Jewish faith, the law of Moses. If she asked questions, what's Bethlehem like? What are the people like? You see, these are ordinary people like us that God's doing extraordinary things through, and he still does in our day, in our age. And then this difficult, dangerous journey is done. They arrive in Bethlehem, Judah, and there they are. Verse 19 continues, and I love this because it's just got a dramatic flair to it. And as I was reading it this morning before you, I was reminded of the account of the birth of Christ where it says, and it happened 
or and so it was. And then we have this incredible thought. When they had come to Bethlehem, that all the city was excited. They were stirred. They were a buzz, we would use in our vernacular. And, you know, news travels uh, really fast, doesn't it? In a small community, news travels really fast in our, in our church because we love each other. We care about each other. We're connected to one another, and it just tends to sort of go. You know, they were so thrilled to see Naomi again. She previously was a, a well-known and prominent person, it seems, being an Ephratite in Bethlehem. She'd been away 10 years, and maybe they were aware of her plight and her husband's and her son's death in Moab, and maybe a lot of them thought they would never, ever see her again, and they were just totally shocked. Have, has that ever happened to you when you just see somebody that maybe you figured you would never, ever see them again in your lifetime, and you're just overjoyed to see them? That's what happened here. That's what happened to me at Harris Teeter in Roanoke, Virginia, seeing Paul Korn for the first time in 25 years and to turn around and give each other a big hug. And he fits this picture perfectly because life had taken its toll on him. But here it says, and the women said, and the emphasis here is on women possibly because the men are out in the fields harvesting. It's April or May. And they say this, is this Naomi? Can this be Naomi? The surprise on them or for them or with them, you just have to really enter into all that's sort of going on. There was an apparent drastic, observable, physical change in her appearance. And I would venture to say also maybe her personality. From maybe that joyous to maybe this thought of an individual who was depressed, as we're going to see in a second. Understandably, she was aged beyond her years, mentally and emotionally and physically. She had traveled to a foreign land to sojourn just for a short while. Ended up staying there 10 years. Her husband dies. Her sons marry. Her sons die. And they return to Bethlehem. What I thought about was pressure, challenge, sorrow, stress, grief, difficulty, distress, discouragement disheartenment. And I think a key thought here is depression. It had all taken its toll on her. You know, I've seen, and I know you guys have many times, those pictures of a president when they take office and then when they leave office and they have aged way beyond four years or eight years. It just takes its toll. Premature aging. I think that was Naomi. She was tired. She was worn out. She probably had said somewhere along the way, I am done. Have you ever said that? I have. I have just said, I am done. I think that's where Naomi was at this particular point. She's home. She's home in Bethlehem, but she's helpless and she's heartbroken. I can so relate to that word heartbroken. Verse 20, 
says, but she said to them, do not call me Naomi. As I thought about that, it just seemed to me that it was just, it was almost like just too painful. The name, which means pleasant, lovely, and delightful, and it, she was probably living that name before she ever left. To hear it probably just brought so much pain. She says, call me Mara. That means bitter, bitter in taste or bitter in experience, and that sort of seems where she has moved to, but God is, is working everything out. But she says in verse 20, why would you call me Mara? Or would she ask for that? She says, for the Almighty. In one sense, that's so positive. She's referencing El Shaddai, the all-powerful one, has dealt very bitterly with me. You see, from her human perspective, her outlook or her viewpoint seems to embody positively that the Lord, the God of Israel, the Almighty, the sovereign and providential one who she knew. And I would say here, she's still believing. She hasn't abandoned her God, but she's not fruitful. She's hurting. Maybe she's looking horizontal. I've done that as well. But negatively here, she says he was against her, which affirms in verse 13 as well, and that he was dealing with her very bitterly. You know, this was like a bittersweet return or homecoming for her to Bethlehem. I'm sure entering into that city, there had to be so many joyous memories. Her marriage the birth of her children, blessing, the people, the places, the unique sights and sounds. Rick and Rachel, I do this every time I go back to Roanoke and go to the wiener stand. <laughs> the sights and the sounds and the pleasant memories of, of growing up. It's not bittersweet for me like it was so much for her. But all those things just come flooding my heart. And then Naomi says, I went out full, in verse 21, to be sure she had a husband and two sons when she left. But they were in a severe famine. There was a food crisis. You know what I thought about on this was a lot of times kind of things look better looking back, don't they? Those were the good old days. We remember some of the good old things, but we kind of forget, by God's grace, the bad old things that might have been going on back there. And she continues in verse 21 and says, And the Lord has brought me home again empty. The Lord is credited with both bringing her home again, but also responsible for her emptiness. Physically, and spiritually. Seems like she comes back with empty hands. She views it as an empty home, but Ruth is with her, and what a blessing she's going to be. An empty heart, um, a famine, a famine of her soul, not physically. As I thought about this, and this really kind of came to play so much for my own life, is that Naomi really is just in a deep depression. Garland Dawson, once we were talking, and he said, you know, depression is just anger turned towards God. I thought that was a really great thought. And I've always remembered that. You know, it's harder, I think, for those of us who are new creations in Christ, or even for Naomi, one who really had a relationship with Jehovah, when things get really hard, we know he could do something about it, don't we? We know he could fix it with the word, don't we? The disciples knew that, and I've known that. And there's been times in my journey here that I, I've just fallen into a depression. Paulie, it's my pout chair. <laughs> and Paul's really good to say, get out of the pout chair. 
do the next thing, keep moving. And I come to my senses. And I think this is a part of what's going on here. And that depression, what I really see here is it leads her to bitterness. I just wanted to just give us a real quick pastor's perspective here. Affliction, adversity, tribulation, testing, and suffering. It results in us choosing to be one of two things. The first is bitter. I've met a lot of bitter people in my life. Have you? The Word of God says they infect others. They're angry. They're critical. They're hateful. They're judgmental. Or it can make us better. Conform to the image of Christ. Those two T's we spoke about when I came back of trusting, deepening our dependence and trust upon God and giving thanks in all things for this is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. See, that's better. Incredibly, as 2020 began, and you can't read this, but one of... Pam's teachers gave her this little thing that you can write on and at the end of last year for Christmas and Pam wrote, you know, stuff on there at the beginning, uh, at the end of the year, you know, have Merry Christmas or whatever. For some reason, I took this and I wrote the word better for 2020. And it was just on my heart and on my mind. And so I wrote that, and that sits in our kitchen, and I see it every single day. It struck me this week that there's only one little, word, one little letter that separates bitter from better, isn't it? It's the word I and E. Not a, not a big, big difference. And a lot of times our perspective, it's not a big, big difference. But you know what? I want to be better. That's what I want. Is that what you want? We can't control the circumstances, the things. Many times our health, we can try. We can't control what's going on in so many dimensions around us. We can do our part. But we can control our responses. We can control to either live in the power of the Holy Spirit or to walk after the flesh. That is a God-given, gracious gift. Warren Wearsby said, that's what faith is all about. Daring to believe that God is working everything for our good even when we don't feel like it or see it happening. Can I get a hearty amen to that? Isn't that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? He just wants you to trust in Him. Even not leaning to your own understanding, your own feelings, your own emotions, just trust Him. And He will direct our paths. He will lead us. That's what He's doing here in this incredible passage of Scripture. She says, why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? See, amazingly, her perspective is all she's seeing is what is right in front of her face, which seems to be loneliness and abandonment and helplessness and hopelessness. You know, if she only could see what was present. See, that's what a part of the stealing is. If she could only have seen around the corner as what was to come, she wouldn't have been referring to herself in these ways. She was alive. She had Ruth, someone that just loved her. 
She was back again with friends who cared about her. Boaz was, was on the future and she had a relationship most importantly with Jehovah and she had his promises and she had him and his blessings. You see, she just needed to add two little words to her life, didn't she? But God. I may be here but God, but God, it's not over. An incredible, incredible thought. And then verse 22 is just our summation and we'll, we'll land this message. So Naomi, it just kind of jumped out at me that she wasn't called Mara here, returned and Ruth, the Moabitess with her, as Charlie has so wisely pointed out, we're seeing this incredible integration of people, of Gentiles and Jews and God's master plan and all that he's working out. Her daughter-in-law with her who returned from the country of Moab. Very precise, very accurate for us to see that Gentiles are a part of God's incredible plan of salvation. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So incredible. That was a time of praise and thanks to God for his goodness and his provision. It was a time of, of celebration. How amazing is it that this is the time they, they enter in of rejoicing and hope and everybody celebrating new beginnings. In God's silent, sovereign providence, note this, he has the right people at the right place at the perfect time to fulfill his plan for his purpose of his glory. This is an incredible several verses in this book that closes out. Ruth 1, 16 to 22, we have Ruth's decision to identify with Naomi, with the Israelites and the Lord, the Almighty, the true and the living God of Israel. And also we have a glimpse at Naomi's human perspective. So how do we respond to it? Oh, why is this important or why should we have even spent an hour today looking into this incredible, incredible book? I just wanted to make, I think, a few really relevant applications for us. And I know they all apply to me and I don't know how they made to you. But the first thing I just want us to note is that God is in control. He is sovereign he is providential. He is working a plan. Everything is working together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Beloved ones, we've got to put that in the bank and live on that. I mean moment by moment. So important. This book is showing us the silent working of God. We don't always see it, do we? But be assured he is working. He is willing. He is doing. He is not taking a day off. And man, that causes us to live with courage and confidence and conviction. And identification here. Physically, I identify with Pam. I identify with Virginia Tech, my lapel pin today. I identify with running, but most importantly, we need to spiritually identify with the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, who we are in him. So important. The verse behind me just kept coming to my mind, Luke 9, 23. Not only are we identifying with him to be justified by grace through faith, but we're identifying with him in the process of becoming like him. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, if you desire to 
outlive the indwelling life of Christ. Let him deny himself. Turn away. Take up his cross and follow me. Turn to me. Not following him in our own strength, but manifesting him through the life of Christ and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Will you, will you trust him? Will you believe in him? Will you identify with him and with who you are as a new creation in him? Oh, who we decide to identify with will determine not only our destiny, but also our legacy, the quality, the fruitfulness of our life. One other thought is just perspective. Oh, if I could just get one thing out, it's be careful of your perspective. It can't just be earthly, natural, temporal. It will lead you to be critical and negative and hopeless. No, our perspective needs to be heavenly and spiritual, eternal. God is working this huge plan. We may not see it all, but we know what it is. And we need to be positive in that regard, encouraging Uh, We're wise as serpents, gentle as doves, living in faith and hope and love. Oh, will you look unto Jesus? And then the last thought is just new beginnings. We're new creations in Christ. And Alexander White said that the Christian life is one of multiplied new beginnings. Every day has a new beginning, doesn't it? A sunrise that comes up. The Christian life is full of new beginnings. And I just want to say this to us. God has a perfect person. You. God has a perfect place. Here. 2020. United States of America. He has a perfect time. Right now to fulfill his perfect plan for you and for his glory. Will you say to him, Lord, here I am. I may not understand it all, but here I am. Take my life. Let it be. Fulfill your plan for me, for others, and for your glory. Father, we thank you for this incredible revelation in Ruth, and we thank you so much for encouraging and strengthening our hearts. Thank you for allowing us to see the silent hand of God, that we can trust your heart when we can't trace your hand. Today, in a new and afresh, I say, here I am. Send me. Take my life. And may my brothers and sisters here that are gathered here that may hear this, may they say the same. May we new and afresh present ourselves to you as living sacrifices. And may we abide in the Lord Jesus Christ. And may he bear fruit through us by the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God. We know that we're asking for what we cannot do, but we know that you can do it in us and through us. For with you all things are possible, and we desire your glory above all else. And we pray these things in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All this week, all I could think about was a single hymn. You know that hymn. And I told you that it would be a memorable way to close today. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided 
to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Would you guys stand with me? Will you go with me as I follow? Will you go with me as I follow? Will you go with me as I follow? No turning back, no turning back. No turning back, no turning back. And as my beautiful bride would say, let's do this. <laughs> so let's go out in the name above every name and may he be glorified and magnified. I love you guys and we're all dismissed. Have a great week.